In an edited volume on Gregory of Nyssa's theology published in 2003, I ended my short introduction with the following remark. What if a new pedagogy of Gregory's Trinitarianism should start with the rich insights into incorporation into the life of the Trinity brought about by mature faith, pistis, in the commentary? How would then we turn back to read the import of the earlier, more obviously polemical discussions of the Trinity? The emphases and expectations, or so I wrote then, would be significantly different from those of the old textbook account. I went on to urge in closing a new integration of what modernity had, as I put it, balefully dubbed Gregory's spirituality on the one hand over against his theology and philosophy on the other. And I did have Daniello in mind when I wrote that. My purpose in today's short paper then is to make good on that promissory note in rethinking Gregory of Nyssa and to attempt a further clarification and assessment of the novel emphases of Trinitarian theology to be found in Nyssa's last great work. I am well aware that in the years since the appearance of the little rethinking uh, Gregory of Nyssa book and especially in the profusion of excellent papers given at this very conference, some of this integrative work has already been done and with great panache. I think of John Baer's textbooks which do incorporate the commentary work or the work of Martin Laird, Julio himself, uh, Morwenna Ludlow. So if I sound at this point of the conference like a broken record, then it will simply be because this paradigm shift in interpretation has happily, at least in some circles, already become a reality. But perhaps nonetheless I may still add something to its force by a certain retrospective clarification, even systematization, of the effects of that paradigm shift for a full account of Gregory's Trinitarianism, since the matter clearly still remains contentious, as has emerged also at this conference. Yet I make that claim of systematization, of course, with a due sense of irony. Gregory himself is no systematic thinker whatever, especially not in the modern sense, but simply discourses freely in the genre appropriate to a particular context. Thus, there are certain dangers, not least of anachronistic imposition, in attempting to tidy up after him in the way I propose. Nonetheless, I shall argue there is something important to be gained by focusing schematically on the distinctive new dimensions of Trinitarian thinking which emerge only in the Song Commentary. And the methodological significance of these shifts for any teaching that we do about the doctrine of the Trinity in Gregory. The main problem that confronts us in the song, of course, is the seemingly random, erratic, and exotic imprecision of Trinitarian imagery which permeates the text, Quay Commentary, in contrast with the earlier apologetic treatises on the Trinity waged against late Arianism and devoted precisely to philosophical rigor and clarity for the purposes of warding off doctrinal error. A modern Lacanian might say that Gregory has now adopted the semiotic over against the symbolic voice. A modern analytic philosopher might charge that he has deserted coherence for fatal inconsistency. Is this type of exposition an aporia for the dogmatician in search of Gregory's full Trinitarian nachlas then, or does it represent a climax to it? The question becomes particularly charged in the context of this conference in the important methodological divergences, evidence, I think, between Volker Dreykel and Brugge La Rousse last uh, Thursday. I shall be arguing here for the climax over the aporia view, although not without critical admissions, and I shall proceed briefly in four stages. First, I shall draw attention to the very precise, not sloppy or careless way in which Gregory conjoins apophatic discourse with the profusion of what he calls enigmas for Trinitarian reflection in the commentary work. This is an entirely intentional strategy, I shall show. Indeed, finally, according to him, the most appropriate to the matter in hand, not a lapse into confusion or incoherence. And it certainly does not abandon Trinitarian reflection of a noteworthy and distinctive sort. Second, I shall draw attention to the specific significance of the epistemology of desire and gender 
for an account of the song's rele re re relevance for Trinitarian thought. Again, this is not an optional ad hoc or embarrassing accompaniment, but the only posture for Gregory from which to speak ecstatically of God as Trinity, odd as it may seem to the modern commentator. Third, and most important, what this implies for Trinitarian exposition is the notion of a sliding scale of insight into the nature of God, which is ranged along the development of spiritual sense and the pu purification of passion in the growth of virtue. Hence, doctrinal truth for Gregory is not enunciated on a flat plane, but in via towards union and ecstasy. The way the Christian understands the Trinity will change along that path. This in turn means that the Spirit's invitation into the life of God signals a progressive mingling with Christ, which Professor Dreckel sees as the unfortunate collapse of Trinitarianism into Christology, but which I suggest in contrast Gregory would see differently. This is precisely the point in which extrinsic theorization about the Trinity issues in incorporation into the life of God in union with Christ. What we now call Trinitarianism and Christology are, therefore, inseparable for Gregory. Finally and fourthly, I shall draw some conclusions about what this means for Gregory's doctrine of the Trinity when compared with still standard contemporary textbook accounts. There is indeed a significant set of doctrinal implications which I shall enumerate in closing for all the problems which this approach also brings in its train. Number one the longest section, apophasis and enigma. Gregory's denial of any knowledge of God in essence is carried over, of course, from his celebrated Trinitarian apologetic treatises of the middle period, but given, I submit, an important new twist in the late commentaries. In no way has he departed from his insistence that we find repeatedly in the contrary Eunomian writings that, quote, there is no faculty adequate to the full comprehension of the divine essence, usia but he is remarkably precise and clear, his word, about the implications of this doctrine for engagement with the biblical text, which induces a new level of philosophia. I quote from homily 6, philosophical treatment of these matters, he writes, transposes the surface meaning of the thoughts into the key of the pure and immaterial and sets forth the teachings of the faith using the enigmas provided by the events narrated in order to arrive at a clear grasp of what is revealed. He goes on, citing, not for the first or last time, the case of Moses in Exodus 20 and the psalm verse that God makes darkness his hiding place. I quote, When I have entered into the invisible with the world of sense left behind me, when I am seeking what is hidden in the darkness, that is when I have indeed laid hold on love for the one I desire, but the object of my love has flown from my usual net of thoughts. But he then adds just a little later, no sooner had I left behind every conceptual approach than I found the beloved by faith, and holding on by faith's grasp to the one I have found, I will not let go until he is within my chamber." Close quote. Martin Laird is entirely right then in his Gregory of Nyssa and the Grasp of Faith to point out, in correction of Danielu on this point, that Gregory's celebrated darkness theme is in every way complemented, though of course paradoxically, by the new clarity and luminosity of what emerges in the bride who has undergone the necessary epistemological and moral transformation. As Gregory puts it explicitly in Homily 11, there was a time when the bride was dark, but when she separated herself from any kinship with evil and sought in that mystical kiss to bring her mouth to the fount of light, then she became beautiful and good, illumined by the light of truth. Crucial here, however, is a proper understanding of the mode of discourse, the riddle, enigma, parable, all explained in the preface, suitable to this form of philosophia, we are in a notably different world from the apologetic dis Trinitarian discourses, but one more profound, not less, if Gregory is to be believed, discoursing now with a Solomonic wisdom, transcending, as he puts it, the heights of mere human wisdom. Close quote. 
Moreover, it is certainly not the case that Trinitarianism has disappeared from the text of the song once we look for the appropriate new enigmatic manifestations of it. Indeed, a profusion of different metaphors for the Trinity suitable to this discourse are scattered throughout the homilies, sometimes chaotically entangled with one another. The most extended example of, of such comes in the oft commented upon passage in homily 4 in which the bride receives an arrow of love into her heart, shot by the father who is the archer, the son who is the arrow, and the spirit is that in which the arrow is dipped. Conjoined with this image, however, is the son as bridegroom, with his left hand under the bride's head and his right hand receiving her body. From the song 2, 5 to 6. Just as the arrow penetrates the bride's soul with the wound of love, so the bridegroom penetrates, takes possession of the bride. But the bride then herself becomes an extension or replication of the son's arrow, since she has been allowed to participate in his eternal incorruptibility. Another Trinitarian superimposition of images also comes a little earlier in Homily 4, when the bride is escorted by the spirit of prophecy, who is also a dove, into a new filial relationship to her true father alongside the son, and so herself becomes dove-like, quote, gazing at the mystery through dove's eyes. Yet confusingly enough, she is at the same time turned into a lily, no longer injured by thorny temptations. Yet a further significant visual image for the Trinity arises in homily 12, in which the spirit is the wind sent by the Father in the sails of the vessel, the church, that moves to contemplate the word, and in which the song text acts as pilot. Finally, there is the remarkable climax of homily 15, in which, commenting on John 17:21 in the farewell discourses, Gregory describes the spirit in what would come to be seen later as an exclusively Western prerogative, as the bond, syndeticon, of glory between father and son, that glory again overflowing to the church. Now many other fragmentary quasi-Trinitarian images are also added in passing to this collage. But the important point is that Gregory allows himself to discourse freely and imaginatively from the song text and whatever it suggests to him glorying in a wealth of mutually bombarding images, instead of choosing one or two key analogies to illustrate the rational coherence of a God who is simultaneously three and one, as in his apologetic texts on the Trinity, the emphasis is instead on incorporation into and extension of the energia of the Trinity into the life of the believer or the church. And the seeming illogicality of this profusion of images is surely quite deliberate. One finds here indeed an anticipation of what is later to be stated explicitly by the pseudo Dionysius in his mystical theology, a policy of creative metaphoric profusion, precisely to guard the divine mystery, to prevent any idolatrous freezing of one set of analogies for God. Yet to repeat my main first point here before moving forward, there is nothing sloppy in my view, nothing unclear in Gregory's own words about his different approach to the Trinity in the homilies than elsewhere, his particular new combination here of apophasis and riddle. It is simply a matter of rightly understanding what, what we might call the rules of this philosophic game. As he puts it explicitly in the preface, I quote, unless one perceives the truth in these matters through philosophy, in this exegetical sense, what is being said will appear to the inattentive to be incoherent or mythical, close quote. I now pass on to my remaining points, which can be dealt with more succinctly now these proposed ground rules for interpretation have been established. Two. So what then, secondly, is specific to the Trinitarian epistemology of the song commentary in particular, given Gregory's insistence about these rules for exegetical philosophia to call? The crucial thing to bear in mind first is the ascending logic of the Solomonic ascent of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Song of Songs, as Gregory too reminds his readers at the outset of the commentary in Homily 1. So in the song commentary, Gregory's congregation, 
even if they are still fleshly minded, as he puts it at the outset, are now being invited into the purgative apex of the ascent. And what this requires is both a different sort of thinking about the Trinity from the inside of the life of God, as it were, and correlatively a different sort of epistemic and moral approach from here to fall. And these are closely connected. It is not just that one is freed up at this stage to entertain a glorious profusion of Trinitarian metaphors, my first point, but that also, I now submit in point two, the way of thinking about participation, metusia, in the life of the Trinity has subtly shifted for Gregory at this stage of the Christian life. This is admittedly not an absolute disjunction from the earlier language of participation in the Trinity in the apologetic works, but I do think it a significant difference of emphasis. Instead of the Spirit inviting one into the taxis of the three-in-one on a linear or chain model, a way of thinking that Gregory, of course, inherited from his brother Basil, we think especially of the famous text in De Spiritu Sancto 9.23, where you send back up the hierarchy from the Spirit with the, with the Son to the Father. But in the song commentary, we get something inspired much more directly by the reflexive dialectical incorporation into God suggested by Romans 8, 26 following. That is, the Spirit scoops up the Christian prayer into union with the suffering and triumphant Christ and so is progressively adopted into the Son's filial posture, adopted into intimacy thereby with the true as opposed to what Gregory calls the false father. Gregory discourses explicitly on this, again in homily 4. But note that this does not leave the epistemic subject as she began. This is more truly, says Gregory, the posture of a daughter or a sister than that of a son. He mentions this again in homily 11. Since something crucial has happened, by the ecstatic intensification of the desire of the bride for the bridegroom wrought in the spirit. Desire has now become as much receptive as endlessly questing. And the climax of Gregory's extraordinarily complex and rich theory of what we now call gender has been reached in the process. As Raphael Cadenhead has argued convincingly in his recent Cambridge doctoral thesis, putting a number of contemporary exegetes of gender in Gregory to shame, including me in my earlier writings. It's so good to have doctoral students who put you right. The normative femininity of the song commentary in The Bride is sui generis and passes beyond anything enunciated in the life of Moses. This is nothing to do with the negative womanishness discussed there and beyond, too, even the positive manly virtues enunciated there also and in many other earlier texts. Indeed, the manly hoplites who surround the bride and her bed at the end of homily 6, guarding her virtue and representing her victory in Encretia over the negative passions, are precisely that positive vision of masculinity which is now trumped or perhaps finally assumed into the active passivity of the bride's supreme erotic intensity. As Gregory puts it himself, I quote, that is why the king's, that is Christ's marriage bed, must be surrounded by a circle of hoplites. Their skill in fighting and their possession of a sword ready on thigh breeds astonishment and terror in the dark thoughts that waylay and assault those who are upright of heart. Safely inside their circle, however, is the mystic bed where Christ comes into union with the bride, the adopted child, through her new invulnerability to passion. Strangely, one of the effects of this moral and epistemic transformation is not only to feminize the Christian, this is either man or woman, of course, in this sui generis way, but also, as we hear in homilies 7 and 15, to free up the Christian to call the persons of the Trinity mother as well as father. In short, and to sum up the second point, the complex analyses of transformed desire and transformed gender, which go together throughout the homilies, are not optional accompaniments to the new approach to the Trinity enunciated at this stage of ascent, but intrinsic to the undertaking. 
The Christian soul is now invited into an ecstatic participation in the inner life of the Trinity. But this comes with enormous moral demands and a profound shift in consciousness about how gendered, desiring selfhood is to respond to God. Thirdly, and most importantly, Gregory's much vaunted doctrine of the spiritual senses, so-called, is by the same token to be fitted crucially into this same growth of ascent. However, for all John Danielou's brilliance in first highlighting this theme in the song commentary, to which we are all indebted, his treatment, I believe, contains some distracting and misleading dimensions. In a recent essay on this issue, in a book that I co-edited with Paul Gavrieluk called The Spiritual Senses, I have argued first that the spiritual sense trope is one that runs throughout Gregory's oeuvre. It does not just emerge fully blown in the late commentary works, and with significant shifts at transitional moments in Gregory's career, especially in the dialogue with Macrina in De Anima et De Resurrectione, when the epistemological problem of small-souled perception is first discussed in some detail. The teaching on spiritual sense is then, as I see it, a feature of Gregory's epistemology in general, and not just of his account of la vie spirituelle, as Daniel, Danielu would have had it. But it is also more ad hoc in its enunciation than Danielu would suggest by his theory of a doctrine of spiritual sense in Gregory. When one does a consistent trawl through his commentary for the language of spiritual sense, a completely ordered account is not vouchsafed. What is distinctive to the commentary treatment, however, is a new attention to the purified lower senses, taste, touch, smell, as well as the senses of hearing and sight. For now the self, in all her fleshly dimensions, is being progressively purified. But it is not the case that the lower senses consistently trump the higher, or that the bride remains forever in visual darkness, as I think Danielu suggests, despite the impression given at that logic in one important passage in Homily 6, which he leans on. Yet earlier in the same Homily 6, Gregory will rehearse the language of all the senses in quick succession, and then add that the bride is becoming through this more clear-sighted and starting to see the one whom she desires. And earlier still, in homily 3, Gregory will make the holy characteristic remark that the birth of Jesus in each one of us, understood here through the transformation of spiritual sense, which is mentioned, is, quote, not the same in all, but dwells in a way that accords with the capacity of the one into whom he comes. It follows, it seems to me, that the ordering of the purification of sense may occur in different people differently, depending on their natural attraits or weaknesses. This integration and transformation of sensual life is, however, all part and parcel of the transformation in virtue and mastery of the passions already discussed. The spiritual sense teaches, therefore, teaching, therefore, is both epistemological and moral in its implications. It is a major tool by which Gregory speaks of human selfhood's responsive transformation by the Holy Spirit along the diachronic line of journey into God as Trinity. When he speaks about the ontological condition of union with Christ, thereby achieved, however, his preferred vocabulary is usually the contentious language of mingling. Mingling between human and divine natures in Christ, mingling between the individual soul or the church with Christ, and the underlying erotic allusion to sexual mingling. And in one case, in homily 4, all three of these jumble on top of one another, quite intentionally. But the language of mixes and crassis and cognates is pervasive throughout the commentary once you start looking for it. It follows then that what in the modern period we call Christology as opposed to Trinitarianism are for Gregory, according to this progressive logic of the ascent of the song, inexorably conjoined. To be knit into the Trinity by the Spirit's adoption and through the operation of spiritual sense wrought by the Spirit is to become mingled with Christ. And if this appears like a frustrating sleight of hand or a false reduction of Trinity to Christology, then we may be missing the plot of the gift of spiritual sensation 
that propels the whole transformative enterprise in this text. One final effect for Trinitarian thinking of the distinctive song type I have been outlining in this paper comes, as mentioned earlier, in the very last homily, number 15, and surprises us there yet further with its novelty. The assertion of the Holy Spirit within the Trinity as bond of glory, doxa, between Father and Son, overflowing into the life of the Church through the first disciples. I quote, Therefore, the person who has left immaturity behind, Gregory concludes, and by impassibility and purity has become a recipient of the Spirit's glory. This is that perfect dove on whom the bridegroom looks. Close quote. I think it is important to note that this incorporative and overflowing Trinitarian logic is entirely of a piece with the other distinctive features of the song's implicit Trinitarianism that I've outlined. And as Julia Maspero has argued brilliantly in more than one place of late, we have here a certain late breakthrough in Gregory's Trinitarian logic, pressing towards some reorientation of his notion of intra-Trinitarian processions, a suggestion that the principle of arche in the Father must be as much receptive as originative. What I might want to add to that insight in closing my analysis is that it is not a coincidence that this last development in Gregory's Trinitarian thinking comes at the end of his commentary, in which he has submitted himself and his audience to a new and different form of Trinitarian thinking, one not forged on a flat plane, flat plane looking outwards to the skeptic or heretic or pagan philosopher or eunomian, but one looking inwards into the church and concocted out of the ascending progressive task of ever deeper incorporation into the life of God. Four, let me now come to some brief conclusions and a recapitulation of what I have and have not argued in this short paper. The main burden of my argument has simply been Gregory's own, that he is combining in his song commentary a particular coordination of apophatic speech and what he calls enigmas, and that this has important and novel implications for the form of Trinitarianism he here espouses. Coming straight from his earlier treatises on the Trinity, especially the Ad Ablabium and Cognate writings and the contra Eunomian texts, we may be forgiven for scarcely recognizing what Gregory is now up to. No longer is he concerned to expound how the three persons can also be one or how the so-called economy reveals the imminent life of God without abrogating those same rules of theological grammar. Instead, taking those apologetic discourses as read, he free associates exegetically, scattering a chaotic range of loose Trinitarian images in his wake. But if this looks like carelessness, to use a term of Oscar Wilde, this is in fact a false rendition. Instead, Gregory now regards himself as freed up to a discourse, trini to discourse trinitarianly in a new mode, suitable to the higher slopes of Christian ascent and to the mystical body of the church. Thus, as I've argued along the way, the song deserves not only to be taken seriously as a source for Gregory's Trinitarian thought, but it actually changes and completes the vision of the Trinity to be gleaned from Gregory's earlier Trinitarian writings in some significant ways. By its deliberate profusion of new metaphors for the Trinity, by the shift of emphasis away from a consistently ordered hierarchy or taxis, Father, Son, Spirit, to a dialectical adoptive child of God incorporation via the Spirit into union with Christ, by the conjoined emphasis on Christological mingling for the individual and for the church as a whole, and by his final vision of the Spirit as bond of unity between Father and Son, subtly transforming thereby the idea of causality within the imminent trinity. There are, of course, remaining problems which have already exercised us repeatedly in this colloquium. In particular, the implications from the perspective of later Chalcedonian orthodoxy of a Christology of mingling and the difficulty of accounting for the relationship exactly of this new Trinitarian vision to the very different genre of discourse about the Trinity 
that the better known apologetic works enshrine. These problems may or may not be insuperable. We can discuss this now for a few minutes. But what I hope I have laid before you this morning is at least a provocative account of what Trinitarianism might look like in via, as I call it, up the demanding slopes of ascetic transformation to which the song, according to Gregory, calls all its Christian readers. I thank you. Thank you.